welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to remain seated. And I'm going to get down on my knees and let's pray. Is that okay? Because we're going to go to the word of the Lord in just a few minutes. So Father, we come to you in the name of of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We humble ourselves before you and before your people, Lord, because we want everyone to understand that it is not a man that's going to minister tonight, but the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We're such a grateful people that we don't have to go to church. (laughs) We get to go to church. And thank you, Lord, for developing such a great church with a heart for your people and a heart for goodness and a heart for ministry. And we thank you, Father. It's a very real place as we come before you this night that you have created. We're so happy to be a part of it. And, Lord, also we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you would bless us, we would ask that you bless them. And we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Listen, let's go to the Word of God tonight, but let's do this as a Bible study, and let's have some fun in the Word tonight. I want you to just go with me to Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter. I want to read, if I may, to you Ecclesiastes. You'll find Ecclesiastes right behind Proverbs. Same writer of Proverbs, the same writer of Ecclesiastes. And you'll find in the ninth chapter of Ecclesiastes a wonderful saying that says, whatever your hand finds to do. So many times we want to just do our own thing. We don't like what it is we do. We don't really judge what we do is important. But this is a wonderful little verse that says, whatever your hand finds to do. I mean, whatever that is, good, bad, different. Notice the word whatever. Whatever doesn't say whatever your hand finds to do that you like. Whatever your hand finds to do that you feel is important. Whatever you're trained to do. No, I didn't say that. Whatever your hand finds to do. And then it says, do it with your might. Old King James, I believe it is, or one of the translations says, do it with all of your might. And then he comes along and he says, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave. <laughs> Where you're going. In other words, you got a time here on earth. And you better do something with that time. And of course, the things that we're talking about are the things of the Lord. For all of us that are in here, you're going to have something to do. And God's watching to see how you do it. Do you do it with a zeal or a passion or a, an emphasis? Or do you just try to get by with where you're at. When you try to get by with where you're at, you're not fulfilling what God says for you to do. I love the people who get jobs. They thank God for getting a job, and three weeks later, they're complaining about their job. Like, please slap yourself. Thank God you get a job, and it may not be the most spiritual job, but do it onto the Lord. He's your real boss anyway. And so when you start complaining, you're really complaining about God who doesn't know what you need. So whatever it is you find to do, and then he says, do it with all your might or do it with your might, comes along and says, there ought to be a passion, there ought to be an emphasis, there ought to be, if you will, an excitement behind it. There ought to be, listen to this word, a zeal behind what you do. I can't imagine being married to Deborah and not having a zeal for her. And I'm grateful that my wife has a zeal for me. But more importantly than the zeal that she has for me is the zeal that Deborah has. And I fell in love with this. As pretty as she is and as wonderful as she is, I fell in love with the zeal that she had for the Lord. I knew I could trust that. 
And God looks the same way at all of us. When there's a zeal for God, there's a trust that goes along with the zeal. Tonight, it's called developing a zeal for God. One of the things that I remember as a young man is I remember being part of a church. I actually started a church in Santa Barbara, California. It was a non-denominational church, which really became a denomination later on. It was kind of a bridge church, if you will. Bridge, what I mean by that is that people were coming out of denominational thinking and going into more of a different type of Christian thinking. It was a little bit more enthusiastic, a little bit more energetic. And, um, I, and I really loved the Bridge Church, but I found out something about Bridge Churches and I couldn't stay there. I just was too excited for God and wanted too much and needed more. Have you ever been there where you just aren't satisfied where you're at with God? And then I started realizing that anybody and everybody that's mentioned in the scripture that's ever done anything had something on the inside of them. Not only faith, not only courage, not only perseverance, but they also had something called zeal for God. And man, I never want this church to ever lose its zeal. And I think the zeal that we have is not as much as, as zeal we could have. And sometimes with the battles of life and the trials and the pressures of life and the times that come and the economics that are upon us and the situation of the world and the condition of the church itself, we sometimes get amazingly discouraged as we are approaching the future. We come to a place where, you know, we lose our zeal for the things of God. I was thinking just today about a little whore yeah, I said the word whore. Let me put it in nice terms. That word whore is a word used probably in San Bernardino a lot, but it's used ho in San Bernardino. But let me put it in nicer terms and use the word prostitute. There was a prostitute in the Bible that was an amazing lady. Rahab the harlot. You want to read about her? She's pretty amazing. Here's this woman who's non-Jewish. Remember, a Gentile, if you will, but in those days didn't have Gentile. Just non-Jewish. A heathen from an Amorite tribe. And she had no scripture in front of her. No Bible in front of her. She had nothing. She didn't know anything. Just somebody told her about the God of Israel and it just dropped on the inside of her. This God of Israel is amazing and she carried a zeal for this God of Israel. So God used her in the walls of Jericho because that's where her business was, was in the walls of Jericho. And you know how it is that she let the spies in and she protected them and let them out and they said, when we come back, we'll protect you. And sure enough, she was protected. Did you know that that woman who didn't have a covenant with God, an Amorite woman who was non-Jewish, who was a prostitute, listen to this, is in the bloodline of Jesus. That's a shock. Her great, 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 great grandson is David. <laughs> Don't tell me God's not in the business of using people. What makes her wanting to be used? Why did God spot her? Why did God see her? Why does God see her differently than maybe he sees you or me? I believe it's just a little product called zeal. Just, just radical for God. Just excited about God. Just ready to lay it all down about God. It's just you cannot get away from this. And when America gets to the place where it's compromised, what we have is we have a society and a Christian society that is compromised. It will never fulfill, nor will it ever help, nor will it ever carry the anointing that's going to break the yoke that'll go after that 11-year-old little girl and help her and bless her and tell her it's okay that Jesus is Lord and he can take care of her because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and then do something about it. My goodness sakes, we will just all be deadbeat people who go to church and let somebody eventually end up throwing smoke and incense all over us. 
thinking that's good enough. When, in fact, if we don't develop a zeal for God, a zeal to the place where your relatives think you're nuts. Now, there's a difference between a godly zeal and a foolish zeal. I'm not telling you to take your Bible and beat everybody up at work and walk down the hallways speaking in tongues and acting stupid. Your boss pays you to work, doesn't pay you to preach. But I am saying to you that you need to be a person that when it comes to God and you've got God time, man, there's nothing going to stop you from God. There's a passion on the inside of you that's never going to stop you. And developing that zeal and keeping that zeal, which is one of the things I find that a lot of people don't do, is they don't keep the zeal they originally started with. Pressures take it away. Churches take it away. People take it away. Leadership takes it away. When in fact, none of us in leadership are perfect. I want to give you an emphasis, or give you, um, if I may, a good translation of the word zeal. Enthusiasm way beyond the norm. I didn't say acting like an idiot. I didn't say having some Pentecostal jig in the middle of your business meeting is what God's looking for. God's not looking for fools. Let me just say this to you. You got to get this. The intellectual of intellectuals was Paul the Apostle. If you were to study out his life, the man was incredibly a genius intellectually. But he was not only an intellectual, he was very spiritual. And he was not so intellectual that he threw out the spirit. And he was not so spiritual that he threw out his brain. Are you following me? And man, that's a healthy mature balance. And so sometimes we get so wild in our zeal that we turn everybody off. Then can I just say this to you? Your, your zeal is just something for yourself and it's not for God. But we can have a zeal on the inside that so motivates us that we just keep on keeping on, keep on going with God. And sometimes we have to be like Paul who writes to Timothy, stir up the gifts. Amen. And who's to stir them up but you? Nobody, I can't stir them up. But you have got to keep yourself fired up for God. You got to keep yourself when the whole world is looking like it's failing. I mean, in Rahab's world, if you stop thinking about it, her whole nation is failing before her very eyes. And yet she comes out alive. That's amazing to me. It's amazing because... I would have fallen apart thinking if I, they're all dead, I'm going to die too. But she kept something. She kept her heart. She was so zealous for God. She just knew this God would take care of her, and he did. And he'll do the same for you, my friends. I want to just go to how to develop zeal. It's really interesting. I was just There's probably a million different ways. But I have just four that God gave me quickly. It's just to go over with you, if I may. How to develop zeal. Watch this. Number one, start with your own house. In other words, if you can't be zealous in your own spot, how in the world can you be zealous with somebody else and somewhere else? And we ought to be a people who are wise enough to start in a small place. You know, God says don't ever despise small beginnings. And start right where you're at with your own house. Because I know this, if you cannot speak into the lives of the people that live in your house, it's going to be real difficult for you to speak into the life of other people. Somewhere along the line, start where you're at. Especially if you have young children. They're waiting for you and your zeal will be translated to them. It will be just carried to them. The emphasis of your life, what you do, will condition your children, how you act, how you think. Let me tell you how it is. When you're a Democrat, your kids grow up to be Democrats. When you're a Republican, your kids grow up to be Republicans. Most likely, there's some that rebel in between that say a few words, but they usually go back afterwards. 
If you are a turned on Christian, it won't be long before your children are turned on. But if you're going to compromise, I want you to know something right now. You will fail and the zeal of the Lord will not be there for you. And God won't even be there for you. Because nowhere in the Bible do I see anybody that's ever been successful compromising. You have to stay enthusiastic for God all the time, even in the midst of problems and pressures, even in the midst when the world looks like it's going to fail around you. You stay enthusiastic with the things of God. You've got to stir yourself up. Every day I get out of bed and I've got to stir myself every day. Every day I hang my legs over the bed and I start speaking to myself. Every day, your word says, God, your eternal word, you spoke it over everybody, but I receive it personally for my, I'm healed by the strife. I have a mind of God. Before I even get over to the potty, man, I have got the word of God going. Before my bladder goes, the word goes. Are you hearing me? <laughs> Ooh, glory to God. I'm, I'm telling you, this is just good. Developing the seal, start at your own house, Luke the 8th chapter. In Luke the 8th chapter, it's just an interesting thing. This guy that Jesus comes across full of demons. Some people say, I don't believe in demons. Okay, that's just exactly what they want you not to believe. And can I just say something to you? Starting with your own house is not letting your house make its own decisions. The worst thing parents could do, let me say it again so you hear me clearly. The worst thing parents could do, and I'm, I'm sharing with you parents right now, is to make a statement, well, I'll present Christ to my children and they can make up their own mind. And you say, well, what's wrong with that? Everybody does that. That's probably the right way of doing things. Yes, it is if you're not a Christian. There's nothing worse than you can do to let your children make up their own mind. They can't even change their dirty underwear and you're letting them make up their, they can't wash behind their ears, brush their tail, or clean their room and you're going to let them make up their own mind? For me and my house, we will. Sir, you got to have that kind of an attitude of zeal towards things of God. See? And we've always had that. In fact, we used to write that in the cement in every house we built for me and my house, Joshua, you know, and put the scripture reference in there. And my son, when he was pouring concrete in his house, he wrote the same scripture reference. You know why he did that? His daddy did it. Now, here's what I'm saying to you. When you leave your children alone to decide for themselves, the devil decides for them. There's no opposition. He says, oh, <laughs> this is the devil now. He says, I could hardly wait to train your children. If you won't train them, I will. Are you following me? And we make the biggest mistake of our whole entire life with our children because we present something to them and say, now it's your choice. Let me tell you something. I presented and said, you don't have a choice. You're going to eat my food. This is the way it's going to be. You're going to live in my house. You're going to be under my roof. This is the way it's going to be. There's two things going to happen to you. Number one, I'm going to knock the snot out of you if you don't do it. And two, I'm going to throw you out, and I don't care if you're eight. <laughs> because here's the reason why. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. And guess what? They wanted to eat. They wanted to be warm. They liked the clothes. And they liked to be under my arm, getting hugged and loved and kissed and encouraged. So guess what? Case closed. Start in your own house with the zeal. So Jesus is coming along. He runs into this demon-possessed man. Man, the guy's got a legion in him. Doesn't have a devil or two. He's got a bunch. You know, it's like some of your relatives. I know I got some relatives that way. You know what I'm talking about. And they just get a bunch of demons, and he, he casts this demon out. In verse number 38 of Luke, the eighth chapter, it says, Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, and here's what Jesus told that guy now that he's cleaning. The verses before that said he had a sound mind, 
which was amazing. He said these words, return to your own house and tell of the great things that God has done for you. Return. See, sometimes we have a zeal and we take our zeal everywhere else but our own house. So here's how to practice the zeal. Practice it, number one, in your own house. Number two, if we're going to develop a zeal, we're going to have to push past our own inabilities. Number two, push past your own inabilities. The bottom line for everybody in this room, we all have inabilities. God makes up the difference, but you're going to have to get past your own ability. You and I have got to realize that all of us facing life look at life like, I don't know how I'm going to do it. When you first took a job, you were frightened. And you said to yourself, wow, I don't know how to do it. And after a few weeks of learning how to do it, you got comfortable. And then you were no longer frightened anymore. In other words, you learned how to do this. You learned how to make it work. And if I can just share something with you, when it comes to zeal, I don't know how to make zeal work other than to be zealous. In other words, I have to work at it. I have to make myself. I have to stir myself. When I think I don't want to do that, I go do it. When I don't feel like going to church, I go to church. When I don't feel like applying the word. Can I just say something to you? When you start to apply the word of God in your life, there will be times when you just don't want to say it. As stupid as that may sound, you just don't want to do it. You just want to say, oh, man, I'm not going to, I don't know, uh, uh, can I? And it's like it's a hard thing to do. And you're going to have to push through your own inabilities to be, if I'm going to be zealous, I have to work at, uh, I can't see myself as not zealous. I have to see myself as being zealous, even if you're a quiet personality. Even if you're an intellectual type personality, even if you're a person that comes along and has not a lot of expression, you have to start seeing yourself doing something even though you don't have a God-given ability to do it. And then the zeal comes upon you. And I'll prove that to you in the scriptures if I can take you there. It's kind of fun in Acts the 18th chapter. In Acts the 18th chapter. Are you with me tonight? In Acts 18, chapter, watch this, in, in, in verse number 24. Acts 18, 24. And now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in scripture, came to Ephesus. This man has been instructed in the ways of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. So here's this guy He's eloquent, he's in the ways of the Lord, he understands it, he's instructor, and he comes along and says, fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, and then it makes this statement, though he knew only the baptism of John, he didn't even know Jesus, he wasn't even saved. And then you will find a couple who spot him, and they go after him, and get him baptized in the Holy Spirit. He was, but he was fervent first before he got the fervency of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he stirred himself, he made himself, he said to himself, I can do this, I can share this. This is an eloquent man, this is an elegant speaker. He's a person that's in there getting the job done. And he didn't even have any information about Jesus. That means he did not have the power of the Holy Spirit behind him. And then later on, here comes the power of the Holy Spirit that changes him. There are things that you can do just where you're at. Get past yourself. Yes. It's not always just, you know, you have got to make the mind up to get the things of God. Yes. And then the things of God come when you make your mind up. Get past your own frailties. Get past your own insecurities. Get past your own, you know, uh, abilities that cannot get it done. You say, I'm not a person to express zeal. Oh, yes, you are. Don't say that about yourself. Get in there and be the person that expresses the zeal of the Lord. Don't be afraid to say it. Get in there and get it. Now, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Word of God. You have God living on the inside of you. You have the comforter. You have the power of God. You're far ahead of this guy. And yet, he was an expresser 
if you will, if that's a word, of the zeal. Third thing I want to share with you tonight about how to develop the zeal is this is so important for us. Make God's plans your plans. When you make God's plans your plans, most people spend most of their life Christianity trying to get God to fulfill their plans. Wait a minute, stop and think about it. Oh God, I'm going to do this. I want you to be involved in it. But when you realize that's not the right direction, is getting God involved with your plans, but you're to get involved with his plans. And that's what's so important for us to see is that this is about us getting involved with him, not just him getting involved with us. Oh God, here I am and I'm doing this and will you bless it? And God is saying, yes, of course I want to bless it, but I need to have you get in line with me. Find out who I am, what I'm doing, how it works. One of the things that Jesus himself did is he got involved on a constant basis, of course, with his father. Notice what it says in Luke, the second chapter. Verse number 49, I'll just pop it up on the overhead for you. He said to them, as they're seeking out where, where Jesus is at as a young man. Why did you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? I mean, if we are going to make his plans ours, then this lifestyle of zeal for the things of God can't happen until you get into the plan of God. Until you get in what God wants for you. What does God want for you? He wants your home to be blessed. He wants your lifestyle to be blessed. He wants all of your heart. He wants a commitment from you. He wants you to be the expression on the, on the world. He wants you to be the hands. He wants you to be his shoulders. He wants you to be his heart. He wants you to be his mouth. That's what God wants for you. He wants to use you as his personal mouthpiece upon the planet to show the world that's lost and dying that Jesus is alive. And until we get to a place of zeal, we'll never do it. And we got to live there because you never know when the opportunity is going to come. You need to be zealous for the things of God. And when we get into the plan of God, I remember as a young man in, in my early 20s, I ran across this one verse and it jumped out at the page, and I thought I was a heretic for believing it for myself. Those were the days when you read the scripture and you said, oh, wow, that's for the disciples, but it's not for you. Or that's about Jesus, but it's not for you. And then somewhere the light shined and said, hey, this is not about the disciples, not about Jesus, it's about you. And he's telling you this so that you can get involved in his heartbeat. Sure, all of a sudden I got really turned on. In John, the fourth chapter, verse number 34, I'll pop it up on the overhead for you. This verse changed my life, even though it was about Jesus. And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And when I read that, all of a sudden as a young 20 four-year-old man, 25-year-old man. My world changed. All of a sudden, that verse jumped off the page. I still got it in my Bible, that old rickety old Bible. I still have it, and I, and I, and I circled it, and I circled it, and I said this to myself, that word is for me. And I told it to somebody, and they said, oh, man, you must be a heretic, because that's Jesus. You understand I'm in Jesus and Jesus is in me. What he does, I do. He's my example. And if he makes that statement, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, now I got the plan of God. Doesn't mean I can't do business. Doesn't mean I don't love my wife. Doesn't mean I don't raise my kids. Doesn't mean I don't, you know, vote. Doesn't mean I don't do the right things in society and social systems. I do all of that. But here it is. My ultimate goal is to get into the plan of God, and my plan of God that I have and you have is to do his will and to finish the work. Did you know the work of the redemption is done on the cross at Calvary? Nobody's going to the cross anymore. The blood has been shed. The job of redemption's done, but carrying out what the blood did to a lost and dying world, that has not been done yet. And the church is called to do that part. Is anybody listening? It's called zeal. You can't do it until you get into his plans. 
We're talking about developing the zeal, if you will, how to develop it. Remember, we're talking about start with your own family and push through your own inabilities. We're talking about number three, remember making plans and his plans, your plans. Here's number four, you gotta be zealous for souls. I mean, you gotta realize that there's people that are gonna die and go to hell. Have you ever wondered why they're gonna die and go to hell? Could it be their background? Could it be they make choices that are bad? Of course. Could it be that they were brought up differently than you? Why are you here and they're not? You say, well, I make choices. Well, maybe they aren't and don't have the ability to make the choices you have. Maybe they didn't have the mom you had. Maybe they didn't have the dad you had. Maybe they didn't have the education you had. Maybe they didn't have, well, you know, what my kids had with a dad around their, an arm around their dad, a, a dad with their arm around them holding them. I remember my dad was a tough man. I remember his Pendletons. He always wore a Pendleton shirt. He was a head of an organization, wore a suit all day. When he came home, he wore, put his Pendleton on. I could still smell the Pendleton. I could smell his body odor. Those days, they didn't have, uh, you know, underarm deodorants and stuff like that. And I could still smell my dad. And I love that smell. And I remember him holding me. My dad was a tough guy. But I remember him holding me. You ever realize that people are lost and dying and going to hell? Maybe they didn't have a dad like I had. Maybe they didn't have a life like you have. Maybe they didn't have somebody that cared about them. Maybe they didn't know what he told them about Jesus. Maybe what they really need to make their life work is Jesus. And you're the mouthpiece to tell somebody about Jesus. And until you have the zeal, it will never work. We'll just be a dead organization that do nothing. And I don't want to have any part of that. Like I said, that 11-year-old that was pregnant when she was 10 in the city of San Bernardino, that's got to be a heartache for all of us. Don't you want to just run to her aid and help her? My God, my God, what's happening in our society? The antidote for the foolishness that's out there is Jesus Christ. The one who carries that is a people with zeal, not a people with religion. I remember one time I was preached to a young church up in Lake Arrowhead when I started a church up there. A woman came up to me and she said these words to me. She said, I'm leaving the church. I said, oh, why? I'm so sorry to hear that. There's only about 150, 200 people. She says, I'm tired of warfare. I'm tired of all this fighting. I'm tired of all this having to do and working. She said, I just want to have a peaceful relationship with Jesus. It's fine. She left the church. And if I can just say this to all of you, you've never done anything. Ne- they never did anything. Well, we'd all like to have a peaceful relationship with Jesus. You know, in eternity, we're going to. In eternity, we're going to, in heaven, have that peaceful. But here on this earth, we're in a war. And as good soldiers, we're to be equipped and do what God would have us to do. You got a soldier, you got an army that's not full of zeal, it is never going to work. You got an army that just plugs along and never gets anything done, doesn't care, but just wants to have a, you know, a, a nice, but you got to have an army with an attitude. And for all of us that are in here, you got to have attitudes, a simple attitude. It's just a zeal for God. You're so zealous for God, you can't shut up. Just got to tell somebody. We got to go give backpacks. But, oh, pastor, we're trying to pay the church off. I understand, but there's people out there anyway. that We got to feed them. We got to take care of them. We got to do it. We can't just back off and, and just think about ourselves and pay off this building and become a religious institution. It won't be long before you put a white collar on me. And you might as well put a chain around my neck and kill me. Because that ain't going to work. Because it's not about what's around my neck, it's about what's in my heart. And it ought to be that way with every one of us. And we've got to have a zeal for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're going to just have to stir yourself up. Because this church is just beginning. And you can be proud of it. Because it'll be done in a godly way and not some foolish way. A bunch of emotional garbage. 
John, the fourth chapter, verse number 35. Jesus makes this comment. He says, do you not say that there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for harvest. In other words, this is the time. Don't wait. This is the time. Stir yourself up. Be full of zeal. The world is waiting. The people need to get right with God. And the only hope for their future, the only hope for their marriage, the only hope for their children, the only hope for their families, the only hope for their jobs, the only hope for their resources, the only hope for life is Jesus Christ. And it can't be just preached from this pulpit. It's got to be preached with people who have a zeal just like the pulpit. That's what this is all about. Come on, you ought to give me a greater clap offering than that. Paul writes, talk about zeal. In Romans, he says his desire is that all of Israel might be saved. He says, if I could lay my life down for my brethren, I would die for them, but I don't have to because Jesus already did. I'd do it to get them saved. That's the attitude you and I ought to have. A zeal for the things of God. Now, I'm not saying don't take a rest. I'm not saying don't take a break. I'm not saying you can't go play golf or go fishing or have fun, barbecue with your families and love each other and watch television. I'm not saying any of that. But I'm saying don't let that get to you you have such a zeal for God. Don't stop with the shallow things of this world, but stir yourself up to carry the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world because without your zeal, we become a dead church. Come on, somebody. And can I ask you a question? Do we need to send Bernardino? Or the Inland Empire area doesn't need another religious institution. By no means does it need that. What we need is a fervent group of people that believe God for great, mighty, marvelous things. A God that wants to heal them. A God that wants to set them free. A God that wants to save their life. A God that wants to mend their marriages. A God that wants to take their children in. A God that wants to love them so they don't have 11 year olds getting pregnant in the streets of San Bernardino. Come on, somebody. And we, the church of the living God, ought to be people that will not compromise and will not settle for just some religious attitude. There is always more of God. Always more of God. Listen, after all these years of serving God, after all these years of being a theologian, after all of these years of understanding the word of God, after all these years of being a senior pastor, can I say something? I'm gonna stand before you and tell you the truth. And let me tell you something. After all the years of studying God, God is so great and so big, I don't know anything about God. I only know a little bit. So there's always more. You can stir yourself up to new levels on a constant basis. Never stop stirring yourself up to be zealous for the Lord. And for all of us, some of you need to get back. You used to come to Wednesday night services, you don't come. You used to come and help out, you don't do that. You're going backwards instead of forwards. I can't tell you how many people I'll see excited on the front row, two, three rows. Then I'll see them on the seventh, eighth row. Then I'll see them on the ninth, tenth row. Then I'll see them up in the balcony area. And then eventually I don't see them anymore at all. Why? Because they failed to stir themselves up. They failed to remain zealous for the things of the Lord. Now I'm preaching to the choir because you're here on a Sunday night. You guys are good. You guys are strong. You guys are the ones. But with you, you can help the others. Amen. And that's what this is all about. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. I'm finished. Isn't that good? I'm not going to do anything except invite you to get right with God. Some of you that are in here, if you died, let, let me be really blunt with you. If you died, even though you came to church tonight, You'd go to hell. You don't have to do that. And you know who you are. You're not right with God. You're half in, half out, lukewarm. 
not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. You can't get right with God until you give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Jesus says it like this, you must be born again. Bottom line, you have a divine appointment with God. Tonight is that night. And tonight, you can give God all of your heart. We'll pray with you. And you give God all of your life so that you can be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Now listen closely. You can't get to heaven because you're good. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You can't get to heaven because you're nice. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You can't get to heaven because, you know, you celebrate Christmas and Easter every year and you know who Jesus is. The devil knows who Jesus is. The only way to get to heaven, Jesus says, is he is the way, the truth and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. And you must be born again, John 3rd chapter. That means you've got to give God all of your heart. He won't steal it from you. It's your heart. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do it. You've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. And tonight, God brought you here for a reason. To give him all of your heart. To give him all of your life. So here you are in this safe and friendly place. You can really get right with God tonight, once and for all. And it's your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'll pop my hands together. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll go bang. And you hear that sound. Bang. Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is your hand is going up is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. No, I want to give him all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I want to be born again. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I'll see your hand go up. You put it right back down. That simple. But you have to make the call. I can't make it for you. Nobody around you can make it. And it's not some mental ascension. Jesus said it like this. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So you sit there like this when you know you need to go like this. You're making your call and you're making your choice. So you know who you are. There's a bunch of you tonight that need to give God all of your heart, need to give God all of your life. And you can sit there and stare at me, but that won't help you to get to heaven. Or you can give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. But it's better to be embarrassed for a moment in this safe place, isn't it? than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God says and sees. Tonight is your night of salvation. Your call. Sit there and do nothing. And the only wish you had someday when you meet up with God or get your hand up. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Never giving him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. Never giving him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up, I'm speaking to you. The one of those people that are not sure, make sure today is your day of salvation. In this place of salvation. Today is your day. I'm going to count to three. I've done my job. Pop my hands together. Your job now is to get your hand up if you know you need to get right with God. Here it is. You've never given him all of your heart, never given him all of your life. You know who you are then tonight is your night of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three. Thank you. Back here. Back on this side. There's four. God bless you. There's five. Back over here. Anybody else? There's six. There's seven. Back over here. Anybody else? Real quick. There's seven wise people. Anybody else? Go ahead. I see that hand in the family. Let me put it down. There's seven wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else, if you're thinking about doing this, you're saying to yourself, I wonder if I should, you should, I got you, man. There's eight, God bless you, good for you. Good call. Anybody else? It's a wise man. Anybody else want to be wise? Get right with God, or do you just want to sit there and do nothing for the rest of your life? When you know you need to get right with God. You need to stir yourself up. This is how to do it. You need to stir yourself up to make this, there's another one, thank you, there's nine. Anybody else, real quick? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Where are you, number 10? There's number 10. God bless you. Okay, that's cool. Is that good? Huh? That's good, Dad. That's not bad. That's good. 
They'll remember it. My Debbie was seven years old. She remembers coming up in a, on an altar call. To this day, she remembers it. Very important. Anybody else? There's ten wise people. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for ten wise people. All ten of you. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. I want you to get out of your seat. All ten of you. All ten of you now. All ten of you and anybody that should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Check with your neighbor. Say, come on, I'll go with you. But uh, get your stuff, get a neighbor, get your friend. If you're in the family room, get your kids, hurry to the door. Ushers, get up there and help them out. Uh, did you hear me, ushers? Get up there and help them. That's your job now. They're, they're doing it. They're doing it. And help them out. And get, uh, you just, let's all stand and welcome the people as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I come on, come on, hope. No, no, right down here. Are you the dad? Okay, good. Good call, dad. It's good It's good that he's going to do this. So you're going to love it. Right, every one of you, I'll look over here to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. He's going to pray with you and give you some free stuff. Take home, tell you about a program we have to help you get strong in Jesus. Only takes a few moments. Is that okay? So every one of you, we love you. And listen closely. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. So make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.